Well, good morning and welcome to the Day of Calvary by the Sea. It is good to be with you. If you are visiting us for the first time on campus or online, please know that you are welcome, that you are loved, that God is well pleased with you. And please know that you're always welcome in this space. You know, certainly our prayers continue to evolve, shall we say. This morning, I pray for the American Christian Church. Well, why would I do that? Because yet another mass shooting happened this week. Now three elderly people died at an Episcopalian church. During, of all things, a dinner potluck. We pray for the people of Alabama, pray for the greater church in times as these. Although we don't have the right answers, we don't have the right words, we continue to pray for systemic change and action to make our churches, our schools, our supermarkets, our lives safer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It was a regular Thursday morning, 4.55 in the morning. Typically, Los Angeles winter weather is this cold and dry weather. It was my turn to lead a prayer meeting. I was about 19 years old. I was still learning the ropes of ministry, still learning about leadership and responsibility. And I opened the church chapel, turned on the lights, and I kneeled and began to pray. After about five minutes of that, I opened my eyes, and to my surprise, I see an unknown man wearing a red cape and a red rose in his mouth. You heard me right, a man with a red cape and a red rose in his mouth. He had entered the chapel and he was standing in front of the altar. So I attempted to ignore him, but again, I was the only person in the chapel, so I had to keep my eye on him. He began to behave bizarrely, walking back and forth speaking to himself loudly, could not remain still. As others entered the chapel, they were afraid. He continued to be erratic, so I finally approached him, and the moment I approached him, he immediately got close to my face. I asked him, can you please be quiet? He didn't answer. I asked him, what is your name? And he responded in Spanish, somos muchos. We are many in here. He tried to intimidate me and somehow he seemed to be getting taller and taller by the moment as I stood my ground and as I prayed inside but he had no intention of speaking to me. He wanted no part of me. He turned around and left our meeting. You see, I tell you this story because this was my first true encounter with someone who later I came to know was tormented by not one demon, but many demons. This was the day that I knew that demons were not only real, but truly at work in the lives of human beings. These kinds of stories I don't tell often because we don't really know too much about them. It is beyond our understanding. But I share this with you this morning because it pertains to today's passage. I've titled today's sermon, Move Towards the Darkness. 
Today's wisdom derives from Luke's gospel. It's fascinating to consider that the central theme of this passage is the power of Jesus over demons. That's right. We're speaking about demons this morning. Let me ask you something. What do you know about demons? Have you ever encountered a demon? See, according to ancient demonology, these are Satan's demonic subordinates. Demons are bodiless, parasitic, shall we say, on the bodies of other living creatures. In other words, seeking to live in bodies and to inhabit in living bodies. They are fearful of being deprived of an embodied host. But it is my impression that much of Christianity is ill-informed of demonology or simply inexperienced with it. Still, here, this passage directly reveals the moment to the reader. As Jesus arrives to the eastern side of the lake, now he is in this Gentile territory, no longer a Jewish territory. He encounters a man who is living without the basic elements of human civilization. No clothing, no shelter, living in the wilderness among the tombs, bound by chains and shackles. I mean, can you imagine the scene? And the demons exchange words with Jesus. They know who he is. They attempt to negotiate their exit strategy. Yet the irony of the moment is that the de demons feared being casted out into the abyss. And yet they came out of the man and entered a herd of swine that ended up drowning in the lake. What a dramatic scene, right? I think Bill said it at the beginning, a very interesting scripture. For one cannot truly understand the moment unless one realizes just how real the demons were to this community and how real the demons were to this tormented man. There was an intensity, shall we say, to the realness of the demons for these people. After all, the demons were named Legion. I don't know if you caught that. Not one, but many demons. You see, the people were living in fear because of the legion. The legion had created isolation for this man and for this community. It had created exclusion for this man and for this community. It had created isolation for this man and for this community. They were unable to help themselves. They were being tortured tormented. They were being torn apart and they had no solution to the map. And here, right here, is where the wisdom enters the room. Right here is where we engage a conversation that rarely ever happens in the church. We engage a conversation that rarely ever happens in our lives. But we ask the Holy Trinity, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, to guide us, to lead us, to speak to us, to engage us, to say what needs to be said to us this morning. Because this wisdom, this wisdom is for those who are courageous. For those who have courage to move forward towards places of utter darkness, to go to places and to go to people who have been excluded and in isolation. This wisdom is for those who are seeking healing and reconciliation. And here it is, the warning to the redeemed, to the beloved. Do not be so dogmatic about the mission of God. It is wider, deeper than you can ever imagine. Let me explain it the best I can this morning. You see, Jesus was an outsider to this region. 
This was a Gentile region. This was the land of the Gerasenes. Still Jesus came to the aid of this man and of this community. It could be said that Jesus' mission on earth was to go wherever darkness existed. Wherever exclusion existed, wherever isolation existed, Jesus would go there. Even if it meant going beyond the borders of propriety or of cultural and religious appropriateness, it is to say that Jesus is well concerned to heal even the most tormented, even the most socially ostracized human beings and communities. To free them from their torment, from their misery, to clothe them, to soothe them, to liberate them. But I guess what I'm trying to say to you and trying to submit to you this day is that today is a newer holiday, Juneteenth. It's the celebration of the end of Seder, right? But we cannot celebrate the day the end of Rachel. Clearly, exclusion, isolation, hate, white supremacy, gun violence, it's still something that happens in our country. And yet Jesus teaches us in this passage how to respond to such moments. Because Jesus leaves the center to go out to the edges. Leaves the top to go down to the bottom. Jesus is seeking out darkness. Seeking out isolation and exclusion. And you notice when Jesus is confronted by this man, he shows compassion. He shows uh, dignity. He shows uh, uh, a sense of, of, of comfort with someone who everyone else was afraid of. And he was able to bring healing to this man. He was able to restore the man with his community. There was inclusivity again. There was a community and friendship again. But what's interesting about the passage, I'm sure you caught it, is that the people ended up telling Jesus, go away, leave us. And there's something about that that really I had to think about more this week because in many ways, the American Christian church is a lot like this community of Jerusalem. Jesus came to heal them, to restore them, to give them life, hope, joy, union again. And yet the people responded by saying, Jesus, go away. Leave us. It's almost as though they're trying to say, Jesus, we like our system. We like how it benefits us, how it, it's advantageous to us. We like it. It's very lucrative for us. Go away, Jesus. You're disrupting our system. You're disrupting our way of living. And I feel like this morning, if there's anything you can learn about this passage, is this understanding that perhaps these people are not too different than us. That perhaps the community of the Gerasenes valued the pigs, the swine, right? More than the tormented man. Did you hear that? That they were more concerned with the fact that all of those swine had died in the lake. That they were concerned about this man. And this is precisely where we encounter the reality that some value things over people that this community valued the swine because it represented money, it represented financial value, it represented a, a method of income. But no thing is more important than a person. And clearly Jesus has come to disrupt the way of living, this unjust and unhealthy system at play for this community. He moves the man in this community from exclusion and isolation to inclusion and community. Jesus heals the social standing of this man, restores his relationship with his community. But if you notice the man, 
with the demons demonstrated submission, a desire for healing, even answering the questions of Jesus. And see, the point begins here is that there is a need for willingness to be healed. But the healing is just not for the people who are possessed by demons. But the healing is for all who are not possessed by demons. Too often, those already included, already living in community, already living in unity and in friendship, already receiving inclusion, take it for granted. Treating such beautiful things as a spiritual family, as a, a community of inclusion, as something that you deserve, something that is your right, as though you are entitled to it. So I guess what I'm saying is we all need healing. We all need a remedy for our misery, our isolation, our exclusion, our value of things over people. You see, this teaching is where we are merely trying to catch up to God. And Jesus, who rearranges everything, disrupts everything, who is the cosmic hope and salvation of the world, died on a cross, took our shame, failures, mistakes, transgressions, our misery, our exclusion, our isolation, and gives us his forgiveness and his successes and his righteousness. And he resurrected on the third day, giving us the greatest statement of reality, giving us the final chapter of reality, the omega point of history, giving us liberation, salvation, and a new life. What do we do with such liberation, with such salvation? Perhaps the only authentic response for us right now is to go out into this world and share with others how this Trinitarian God has planted an inclusive and communal church here in our now. For many to come and find healing and reconciliation, to find inclusion and community. But friends, it still demands the desire and the willingness to be healed. What if we were known around the island for our inclusion for one another? What if we were known for how disruptive the presence of God is in this place, healing everyone, reconciling everyone, because you must understand that status quo cannot exist in the same space with Jesus' powerful and disruptive presence. We have to understand, people of God, that we must learn to embrace the changes, the disruption that come with Christ's active presence in our churches, in our lives, in our ministry. This is the sign of the active presence of God with us, in us, around us, within us. And it's when that presence moves, it's when that presence showers us, it's when that presence enters us, that we are compelled to go out into this world and share it with them. You see, inclusion demands submission. Inclusion doesn't mean anything goes. Inclusion means you submit to the God who is healing and reconciling the entire world. You trust God's ways. You submit to God's ways. May we today come into that flow. May we today sense that presence with us that is liberating us 
that is moving us from isolation to community, from exclusion to inclusion. Word of God and word of life, and we all say together, thanks be to God.